Alright. So one more time, raise your hand if you fish today. Mm -hmm. Two. Three days. But hey, that means you each get a freebie right off the bat. You attack a box. T-shirt. Would you rather have the t-shirt or the attack box? You get the t-shirt. I'm going to t-shirt. Alright. See, now everybody should have raised their hand to take this today, right? <laughs> Well, we got a few freebies we're going to give away throughout the night. Uh, some stuff from Frayville and Plano. We're going to give away a rod and reel. A bunch of stuff. We're going to talk about ice fishing, right? Everybody's here to talk about ice fishing? Yes. Am I in the right, right place? Yeah. Okay. What? Ice fishing? <laughs> you thought it was musky open water? No, we're going to talk about ice fishing. Uh, and, and what we're going to do tonight. Now, I don't know if anybody here ever been here when I've spoken before. Okay, a handful of you. Um, you'll probably know that I jump around a lot. There's no common theme. It all kind of seems to fold together in the end, but I don't have any set notes or any set plan. So if I say something or show something, if you guys have specific questions about something, you know, we're just 20-some people hanging out and talking. We're not, we're not here to give any kind of seminar. We're here just to talk about stuff that, that I do that's given me some success. Maybe we'll blend it with some of what you do. Uh, but by all means, if you have a question, Shoot your hand up real quick and we'll just answer them as we go. Does that sound like a deal? Okay. Give you a little background of, of uh, what, 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 well, I jumped around already. What we're going to talk about is perch fishing. Okay. And, and, and the lake that we're talking about is Lake St. Clair. How many people ice fish? How many people fish? Raise your hand if you fish. Okay. Raise your hand if you avidly ice fish at least a few times throughout the course of the year. Okay. Now raise your, keep your hand up if, you're, if your primary lake that you fish is Lake St. Clair. And if your number one species you fish for the most is bass, <laughs> is perch. Okay. Now, how many people also do some fishing for walleye? How about this is ice fishing now? How about bluegills and pumpkin seeds, crappies, and how about bass? Does anybody specifically go out and target bass on occasion? Okay. Well, if you ever wanted to, you could here, because the bass fishing here is phenomenal, as everybody probably knows, both largemouth and smallmouth. You'll catch more largemouth ice fishing where we normally fish, which is near shore areas here, than a little smallmouth. Uh, but you can catch smallmouth on the main lake. But you can catch a ton of largemouth stuff right here. You know? So if you're into that, it's pretty fun. They, you know, especially if you're sight fishing, seeing them come in the hole, and it's pretty cool. Most of you have probably have looked down the hole perch fishing there have probably seen some big bass at times. One more time, Pike, anybody? Pike fishing? Okay, so we got avid ice fishermen, you fish for a lot of different stuff, but we're mainly going to talk about perch because probably the number one targeted fish for ice fishermen here is perch. And whereas, whereas you know, 20 years ago, that was like 95% of what people targeted. Now it's blending a little bit, and more people are realizing that there's some great opportunities to catch bluegills, big pumpkin seeds if you're into those, or what a lot of people call sunfish, big crappies, you know. There's a lot of stuff to fish for here, but we're going to talk about perch. And what I'm going to share with you is just some tactics of, of what's coined power fishing for perch. Okay, and, and if you've seen some of the stuff that I've done the last few years, there's been several articles in In Fisherman, and Michigan Outdoors, and Woods and Waters, and all these publications around here uh, that have talked about an approach that we use that's really common on this body of water, fishing with mainly just strictly artificial baits for perch. Now, now, to understand why that works, you got to understand the fish a little bit, okay? And, and a perch is not, a yellow perch we're talking about now, is not in the same category as a bluegill or a bass or a crappie. A million years ago, I went to Michigan State and got a degree in fishery science, and they teach you about three different classes of freshwater fish. There's cold water fish, there's cool water fish, and there's warm water fish. Bass, bluegills, crappies, and sunfishes are warm water fish for the most part. Perch, pike, walleye, and a lot of other species that we also have here are cool water fish. And all that basically means is they spawn in colder water, they usually live in a little bit cooler water, uh, but they behave a little bit differently in cool water, which is why they're so fun to ice fish with. Now, Bluegills and crappies and even some warm water fish can be really uh, aggressive even under the ice. But cool water fish like perch and walleyes, they're just as aggressive under ice as they are in the summertime. 
And I know that may be hard for a lot of people to, to understand and people to believe, but if you look at the methods and things that we use to commonly catch perch here, um, you'll, you'll kind of blend in that focus. And, and what I want you to think about the next time you go ice fishing is that we, we, we fish a body of water here that for a number of reasons you really almost never have to slow down and do the grumpy old man ice fishing thing where you go like this. This sucks, okay? This, you know, moving and bouncing around and using artificials and fishing fast and doing all the things you could do when the perch are really biting, that is, in my opinion, way more fun than just sitting there and begging for a bite. Now, there's there's a little bit to, to take in with all that, but for the most part, you can fish pretty aggressive, okay? So everybody's with me so far? Any questions yet? Everybody's, everybody's with me. So we're going to talk... That's what, if you ever read about power fishing, okay, that's a term that, that kind of started out in the bass fishing world where guys would use, you know, real fast, big, heavy line and big baits for real aggressive fish, and they apply those tactics. Anybody ever hear of Kevin Van Dam? Okay, he's famous for being a guy that just throws crankbaits and fishes fast and goes 100 miles an hour everywhere. That's power fishing, okay, for lack of better terms. So now we've kind of applied that to ice. And I'm here to tell you, that the more I ice fish, the more I have come to realize that you can almost always get away with pretty fast, pretty aggressive tactics, especially for fish. So, so we're going to run through three or four different baits, uh, give you a little background on myself. I grew up fishing on Lake Erie, and I moved here a little over a decade ago. And since that time, uh, I've spent a tremendous amount of time on the ice. I fish almost every day. I live right here in this community. Um, I'm a busy guy like everybody else, but I almost always try and break away for an hour or two in the afternoon and go fishing. I fished 20 minutes ago. Okay, so even in that wind and cold and everything, I just, I got the bug. You know what I mean? And, and anybody that ice fishes here knows, if you don't go, the one day you don't go, when you go the next day, there's an old guy that's walking off the ice and he goes, man, they're not biting, but yesterday it was unbelievable. Sure, and you're here, yeah. Man, the one day I had a holiday party to go to, or whatever it may be. If you go to Selfridge, they catch them at Geno's. If you go to Geno's, they catch them at Metro. It doesn't matter. Somebody's always catching them. So you got to put yourself out there and you got to fish a lot. But, but the one thing that we have going for us here that makes this a very unique fishery and makes these tactics kind of come into play every day is the water is almost always clear, especially after things settle down at first ice. We mainly fish in shallow water, and we fish a body of water that has tremendous numbers of perch. When you're saying shallow water, what, what's your consideration of that shallow? There's days I fish in 18 inches of water, and there's days I fish in 13 feet, just like everybody here. But I'd say 90% of the fishing I do is less than 8 foot. Um, and, you know, Right now, a perfect example is you can catch them in three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine foot of water. There's a lot of fish around, but but that's shallow. And and when I like last year with the Frayville crew, we went up to, to Grand Rapids, Minnesota, and there's like 1,200 lakes in that county. And you can go ice fishing on a different lake every day. You never see anybody. And you go there and you go out in like 40 feet of water and you fish for perch, and you spend a lot of day not catching any. And then you get in one spot that's got some, and you catch a few, and I'm thinking, this is terrible. You know, here, you, you can catch at least little ones pretty much everywhere all the time. We've got, we've got a, and I'm not going to get too off base, but when it comes to fishing and a fishery, Lake St. Clair, if you look at most big lakes, the best part of the big lake is the shallow weed-filled bay with clear water and a little bit of current. we got 25 miles by 25 miles of that. This lake is just a wide spot in a river, essentially, that's a giant, shallow feeding plant. That's why there's so many perch, there's so many bass, there's so many muskies, it's just a real fertile fishery. But because of that, it's not like going some places. You know, when we perch fish on Lake Erie, you don't hardly catch any little ones. Here, a lot of times, the little ones can almost become a nuisance. Anybody that perch fishes here through the ice knows you got to take that into account. So you so you got to kind of adapt your methods for that, and that's that's where we're going to start off, and, and that's the reason 
that you see some of these techniques that you've seen publicized the last few years that are getting so incredibly popular here, people have never heard of them other places. You know, a perfect example of that is the thing that you guys all hear about that you've probably seen a lot of internet reports and articles I've done in different magazines and stuff. This is what's generally referred to as a beaded spoon or what the guys around here call a hard bead. Okay, and this is a diamond willow spoon. There's a million different manufacturers of these. We're going to talk a little bit about these today. Um, but, you know, if you go to other parts of the world, they've never even heard of these. Perch fishing there is still little plastics or a, or a spoon with a minnow on the bottom and little, you know, terribly slow tactics. They don't do this. Okay, so we'll talk about why that works and a little bit about how to work that. Um, but what I, I kind of want to do is, is if you've been here before, You've probably heard me talk about hard bead spoons, okay? And if you've seen the stuff on the internet, there's seminars that I've done on that. Um, so I don't want to spend the whole day talking about that because that's not the only way to, like, power fish or what we're going to talk about. But, but I kind of went back and I thought to myself, you know, what I was going to speak about tonight. And with my fishing, using all artificial baits all the time, I kind of have broken it down into four categories. And if you have a little tackle box like this, you can fit all four categories of baits in that little tackle box and put it in your pocket. And rest assured that almost every single day this year on the ice, you'll have something to catch. Up. Okay? Does anybody know what those four categories are? Let you take a shot. Biggest spoon, catalog, clear job, bear hook. Close. I didn't hear the fourth one. But I think, what was the second one you said? Uh, Jigger Pella. Yep, that's, that's what. I'm going to give you a free. See, I'm trying to come up with ways to give you a free. Here's the plan. Fuck this. Pretty cool t shirt. You probably fit you. The second one he said. How'd you do last night? How'd I do tonight? <laughs> so you're off topic. <laughs> uh, I caught a handful. I mean, I didn't go fishing until 3 30, and it was windy and cold and terrible. <clears throat> I caught a handful, uh, but but the second one he said was was uh, this bait here. Okay, this is a jigging rat. So we'll start there. Uh, the actual way to pronounce this, if you call the company, is Rapala, but everybody calls it a Rapala or Rapala, whatever. Uh, this is a jigging rat, and this is one bait out of the four that we're going to talk about. And we're going to break those four down today into a, a beaded spoon, a jigging wrap a jigging style spoon like this, which there's a million of, from Swedish pimples to, you know, little small jigging spoons, all, uh, Cleo's and all different baits, uh, Frosties. And then the last thing we're probably going to talk about if we've got time is just some different little plastics, because those have really come on strong, okay? And, and, and it's not so much what I've got up here. Know that it's in this shop, I guarantee you. They've got more plastics here than probably any. Um, and those are really, really good when times get tough. But, but let's start with with the jigging wrap. Um, this bait is a bait that you know when it first came on the scene, took the ice fishing world by storm because there was no other lure that was made like this. Okay, it's got a line tie in the center. It's got a fin in the back. You can see from the flex of my rod, this is a very heavy bait. And here, whereas a lot of times they tip these hooks with minnows. Here we can just put a little soft egg or a little plastic of some kind on it, and that's, that's more than sufficient for what you need to have on there. At no time do you need to put live bait on this, on this bait. Okay? What this bait does is it goes down in the hole, and when you jig it fairly aggressively, that little fin causes it to make a big circle around the hole. So the bait goes around and around the hole. The harder and more you jig it, the further you can get it to go out of the hole. If we just put it straight down and just jig it fairly, you know, easy, probably shouldn't have this thing. <clears throat> if we just jig it kind of in this motion, it'll just make little darts and kind of little sachets outside the hole. If you really start snapping it, you can get it to go around and around and around. The reason that this bait is so good is because it not only imitates what the fish eat, but what it's really doing is it's imitating perch feeding on something else. And what happens is when the fish start coming in the hole and they see this thing going around and around and around, 
they think it's a small perch chasing something. And that little bead is what is just settling in the water when you stop to jig. Okay, so um, I, I don't want to bounce around too much. How many people have used jig and wraps, just so I know where I'm at? Okay, now commonly, the bait of most people's choices, and, and what I'm going to do, guys, because as I'm feeling you out, it doesn't make any sense for me to come up here and tell you a bunch of really in-depth stuff if you've never used this. But you guys have used baits like this, so we'll get a little more technical. Do you have any problem with line twists with that? I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Yes, you can get some line twists with that. Um, commonly, what most people use for perch is this size bait. This is a number two. This is the smallest jig and wrap they make. This is a very, very good perch bait. I typically use the next size up, which is a number three. Okay, and what that does is, whenever you use jig and wraps, and there's a few other manufacturers that have similar lures, the larger ones work exactly like the small ones, but just bigger and more. When they circle around the hole, they make a bigger circle. When they flash, because they're bigger, they make a bigger flash, and you can draw fish in from further and further away. I have taken and used the next size up for perch, even bigger than this at times, and it works just as good. But you kind of have to cut it off at some point, mainly because we mainly fish fairly shallow water. This big number three will not work as well in like two foot water. There's physically not enough water column to get that bait moving the way you need to get it moving. And when I fish it, let me take it off so I I typically put it down in the water, let it go to the bottom, lift it just up the, off the bottom, just crank my handle like one time so it's that far off the bottom, and fish it about like that. I want it circling around my hole like this big, okay? And it's just a couple of strokes and a stop, a couple of strokes and a stop. Now, when you're a person like me who's like totally addicted to this, and you spend way too much time looking down a hole in the out, and you get to watch perch for thousands and thousands of hours over the course of, you know, a decade, you start to see that there's different little retrieves and there's different little things that you can do with all these baits that really depend on the day. Some days, they want that thing jigging as fast as you can jig it, and you stop it, and as soon as you stop it, before it even has a time to rock back and forth, a big perch will come in and eat that egg. Just bam. Other days, they want it near the bottom, a couple of strokes, and they want you to hold it still. And if you watch the fish, either with an aqua view, or if you can see down your hole and watch them, on those days, you'll see the fish come in, and they'll look at it, and then they eat. And if you jig it too fast, you won't catch them, or you won't catch the big ones. Sometimes, the bigger fish, and again, I apologize, because I'm gonna bounce all around for it, but sometimes, the bigger fish on this lake, you'll see, they need a much longer pause with whatever lure you're using than the smaller fish. And, and the main reason for that is, if you guys have ever been out here, how many of you, and don't be afraid to admit it, how many of you use minnows? On occasion you use minnows. How many of you have used minnows when you can see down the hole? And how many of you have seen six and seven and eight inch fish come into those minnows with 10 and 12 inch fish behind them and watch the little one eat the minnow and when you pull it out of his mouth, what happens? <clears throat> the big one comes right up behind him and eats the minnow. That <clears throat> happens all the time and you don't even know it. When you fish a beaded spoon and you let your bait go to the bottom and you can't see in the hole and you're jigging it and you're jigging it you stop it and it goes thump and you miss them. And then as soon as you drop it down, it goes thump and you miss them. And then it goes thump and you catch a big one. That big fish is behind that little fish. And when those big fish come in, everybody that's fished out here, that's sight fished or seen down the hole, has had those super frustrating days where it seems like those big fish are laying on the bottom and they will not bite. If you let those little fish bite and you pull the bait out of those little fish's mouths, those big fish bite. My theory is, and there's a million different things we could talk for for years on this subject. 
My theory is, is that as the perch on this lake get bigger, they don't necessarily get smarter. They start to figure out the most efficient ways to feed using the least amount of energy. And then as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, they almost only feed that way. And what happens is, is when a school of bait fish or a bunch of little panfish in the area are, are, are getting picked apart by groups of perch, those little fish crash through those shiners and chase around all those bait fish. And the ones that they don't eat, or the ones that they suck in their little mouths and then they lose because the minnow kicks out of their mouth, those are the ones the big fish just cruise up underneath them and suck them in. Okay? So with a jig and wrap, I don't even know where I was going with that. But, but with a jig and wrap, sometimes when you're really working the bait hard, you have to leave it paused a little bit longer some days than others. That's one way a lot of times to catch a much bigger fish. If you've ever been on this lake and fished with real good fishermen with hard beach, jigging wraps, jigging spoons, whatever, guys that really know how to use artificials, and you've sight fished where you can fin, fin shallow and you can look down the hole and see the fish, and there's an old guy sitting on a bucket, and he's not looking down the hole, and he's cleaning your clock, and every time you're catching them, you're catching little ones, and he all of a sudden just catches a big one. Everybody knows some of the old timers out there. The old school guys out here, a whole bunch of them, never look down the hole. They never fish in shanties, and they just fish one spot and move, one spot and move. They catch big fish. That's what's going on, is those little fish are biting their baits, and they're just not even worrying about it. And they just keep working their bait, and those little fish keep swatting at their baits, and then when a big fish comes in, he can eat the bait, and they catch them. Okay, so sometimes with a jigging wrap, you need to do that. Now the other thing with the jig and ramp is that frequently when you fish the bait, you'll get a big school of fish in your hole that'll be excited. And they'll be chasing that jig and wrap around. You'll be jigging it, pause, jig it, pause, jig it, pause, and you'll catch some, and then they'll kind of get keyed in on it and they'll stop biting. At that time, you need to bring it up in the water column and jig it as hard as you can jig it. I mean like this, where people look at you and think, what are you doing? You jig it like that three or four times. You see the guys I fish with, we do that. We'll, we'll be an eight foot of water lifted three feet off the bottom and jig it four or five times, and you'll see big fish come screaming in the hole after. I'm going to kind of back up because you'll, you'll see a lot of what I'm going to talk about is this common theme. If you go here and you fish in a place, let's just say Geno's, it's the most popular place on this side of the lake. There's 5,000 people fishing there in the course of the week. You're fishing for fish under the ice. When those fish are swimming around on their day-to-day -day routines, and the little fish see something <coughs> smartly, so they go over there and the big fish feed them because they're going to all start feeding on these shiners or whatever it is they're chasing. And you're dropping your bait straight down in the hole. And you jig it, you put it down near the bottom and you lift it up. You jig it, you put it down, you lift it up and you jig it, you put it down. You're sitting over there in your spot, and you're doing the same. You're putting your bait down, and the people back there in their spot are doing the same thing. As those fish are being fished for every single day, the only thing they ever see is this, up and down. If I go bass fishing, and I make a cast, and I reel my lure, and you come behind me, and you make a cast, and you reel your lure, and you do different things to it, it's coming through the water in different ways. Everybody can do it a little bit differently. But ice fishing, your lure can only go up and down. A number of things happen, but the fish get really accustomed to you fishing in a spot. And that general up and down, and all the movement six inches off the bottom. How many people have ever been fishing here, been able to look down the hole, seen fish, caught some fish, they kind of turn off, then you lift your bait up off the bottom for whatever reason, and all of a sudden these fish come from underneath the ice and start swimming up underneath your bait. Or when you can't get them to bite, and you're looking at them, and they're just looking at your bait, and you start lifting it, they all look up, and they all start swimming. And the faster you lift it, the faster they swim up, and then sometimes you can stop it, and one eats it. That's what's going on. The fish get accustomed to seeing your bait in the same exact spot in the water column, down near the bottom, going up and down, no matter what the bait is. So whenever you're using any of these baits, 
If you're not getting bites or if the fish you're fishing for have quit biting, you need to bring your bait up closer to the ice and you need to fish in a different part of the water. Okay? Because we're not casting out and retrieving. We're only fishing one little spot. And this spot to the fish underneath the ice, right here, is way different than right here. When the group of guys I fish with all fish together and we start catching fish, one of the first things we do if we catch a couple of keepers in an area is make about 12 holes. And typically what we do is go from hole to hole to hole. And you'll notice that your first few drops down each hole will be when you'll catch your bigger fish. Then they'll fade off, you'll catch some small ones, it'll die. You'll move over to this hole, as soon as you drop it down, a big fish comes streaming in the hole and eat your bait. That's what's going on. I think that if we ever could get under the ice and watch ourselves fish, it's almost comical. Because the lure comes from the end of the string in that one spot, over and over and over. Okay. Now I, I can go <coughs> forever on topics like that, but, but in any of these situations, once you stop getting bit, you need to raise your bait up and fish it a little high, or fish it a little faster, or slower, or do different things. How long do you usually stay on a hole to work with? That old question, how long do you stay on a hole? Um, me, personally, when I drill a hole, well, there, there's a couple things going on. Nine times out of ten, I have this OCD type of mentality where nine times out of ten, I want to see something. I either want to look down the hole and be able to see the fish, be in a shanty and be able to see the fish, use an aqua view, or use a flasher. If I don't see any kind of activity, I don't stay in a hole more than... Maybe five minutes? If you're by the fish, you're going to see activity on almost your first drop every single time. So the other thing to remember is here is that sometimes you'll fish around and you'll see a lot of little fish or you'll catch a lot of little fish. If you catch six or eight little fish in a row and it's been ten minutes, I'm out of there. Sometimes the exception of that is you can get little fish in the hole and then the big fish come in after. You can see, you'll notice right away as you're working those little fish around, the big fish will come in after. Okay? Now, guys, I gotta keep going because we got I'm gonna go end up talking for three hours. Uh-oh. And it's you of all people. So the gentleman Paul, you would never there's no reason to ever put live bait on there. No. Never put live bait never. on there. Never. Don't need to. The only time I've ever done that is when fishing for walks. Okay. And you would dip it with what? Big shiner okay. We do that on Lake Erie. Would you ever go just a bear hook or you would always No, I would always, always have some kind of egg or a bead on there. Now that's the reason the for it is when that thing slaps <coughs> through the water, that's what the fish then key on and come up and suck in. There's a couple other things with a jig and wrap if you guys use these, but I'll give you a couple little tips. The first is you always have to use a snap. Okay, you never tie directly to this bait. If you do, you'll break your own line. Okay, because it's a metal, sharp metal piece. Always use a snap. Now, for all of my fishing, I use these little cross-locking snaps. I don't use those speed clips where you, you know, put your bait in there and it loops around. The reason for it is a lot of times when I fish, I fish fast enough and aggressive enough where I can make a spoon or something roll back through that. And I've lost too many baits where you go to put your bait down and all of a sudden it just sinks to the bottom. So I use these locking little snaps. So that's actually locked. So you always got, that's just the same as any other snap. That's just the smallest little snap you can buy. Okay, so I always use a snap on it. The other thing you'll notice about my baits with these baits is I cut the front and back hook off. The reason for that is if you catch a thousand perch on this bait this year on this lake, maybe four of them will be hooked on any other hook than that middle one. If I had giant perch come in and eat this bait, and brought them up to the hole and never hooked them and they come off because of that? Yes. When the bait, the whole, the, the big perch can eat the whole bait. That's a one in a thousand type of thing. And that takes away so much frustration of those hook points getting in your gloves, hooking your rods, right. hooking your other line. This way you've only got one hook, it's the belly hook. When you hook it up on your rod, those hooks don't grab anything. Sometimes I'll even leave that like this one, that little point is rolled over on the back so I can hook it. The other thing is, is I usually put on a bigger treble hook than what they come with, only because after you catch a ton of fish on the hook they come with, you can actually bend and break that little hook they come with, so I use a little bit better, heavier hook 
That's a little super technical, but you don't have to do that. And then the last thing is, this isn't actually the line that I would use. We talked about line twist. This bait is the only one that I use <coughs> braided line. Now, all the line I use for ice fishing is Suffix. There's a bunch of different lines you can use. But I use a very, the smallest braided line that you can get. Fire <coughs> line makes it, Suffix makes it. A bunch of them make it where it's only like one or two pound diameter. It's about four pound strength, and I use that for jigging rigs. The reason for that is braided line doesn't have any stretch, but when you snap it, that bait snaps and works a lot faster and a lot better. If you know anybody that's a super jig and wrap freak, like I mainly fish, I use a hard bead probably 90% of the time, everything else the other 10. But I've got some buddies that only use jig and wraps, they all only use braided line. Okay, and plus, you work this bait so hard sometimes that in the course of a day or two, you can break your line. That break never breaks. And when it's digging in the hole and you're kicking your bait back in and the fishing's crazy and you're getting snagged on the ice and you're just ripping your line off and you're doing all those things, you never have to worry about it. This eventually you do. You said that you change the treble at times. What about you just go to standard treble or do you use red? Um, I, I don't know that it matters. I use red. Uh, and, and I will say this, that's a topic for discussion forever. The only time I've ever seen in all my fishing that this make a difference is ice fishing. I've seen walleye fishing where it's noticeably different unless you have a red line. So you might try red. I use little VMC trebles. They come in like 10s and 12s and 14s and they're real roundy, but they're, they're pretty strong. They're not real bendy. I like those quite a bit, so I just put them on here. But that's a little bit about a jig we got to move on. Um, the next category, or the next bait that we're going to talk about some, is just these, these jiggers. Because now, if you, if you fish, you know, for anything through the ice, you've used some kind of jigging spoon. This is, I don't even know the manufacturer of this spoon. This is something I just bought somewhere at Tackle Shop. But, you know, the famous ones, probably the most famous one for ice fishing, and this is a real big example, this is a Swedish pimple. Okay, and most people have used a jig and spoon of some kind. Another really good one um, that I use quite a bit are these little Lindy Frosties. Okay, that's a real good use. The difference between this spoon, and this is kind of a, a unique one, but the difference between this spoon, when we talk about spoons, most people in the world, when you say spoon and ice fish, think of this. A lot of times around here, we use this. This is a hard bead spoon, or what really technically is a wobble spoon. This bait, when you kick it up and you jig it, it swims back down, or it lays sideways in the water. You know, a hard bead, for the most part, when you jig it, it comes up, and when it goes back down, it turns sideways, which causes it to wobble. Some of the beaded spoons will shoot way out from the hole, like these. This is a big long ken spoon. The longer the hard bead spoon, the further, for the most part, it will swim away from you when you jig it. Some of the more short squat hard beaded spoons, <coughs> like this, doesn't swim out as far but it still lays up on its side when it wobbles back down. Whereas these, they do, when you first let them go back down, they do kick out for a second, but then they pretty much sink straight back down. Now, where you'd want to use something like this is in those situations where the fishing's tough, where you're fishing like a hard-beaded spoon and the fish aren't really chasing, the only reason I could say that is because that's how it was today here when I did. You use a beaded spoon, and I was watching them on the camera. They'd come in and they'd take a poke at it every now and then. You'd see them flash on it, and they'd never eat it. You'd drop this down, they'd swim down real fast to see what it was, and then it would just lay there in front of them, you'd just jig it one time, and they'd come in and suck that ball. Sometimes when it's real tough, a jigging spoon like this is a really, really good option. Now, regardless of what kind of spoon you use, we can even go a little bit further with these. 
a bait that I, I want you guys to, to know is can be phenomenal is that I've only seen used around here is this bait. This is a hater. Has anybody ever used this? Who said that right off the bat? You, you knew what it was right off the bat, didn't you? Okay. I'm going to give you a hat. You want a knit hat or a baseball hat? Oh, that's a good hat. A knit hat? Yeah, you have to do it. Cool. This is a halo. Um, I don't know what I do. This bait falls extremely fast. And it's got a chain dropper on it that you put an egg on, just like that one. A little bead or a little egg. And when it falls, it falls kind of sideways for a second, but it falls really, really quick. This is something to mix in your arsenal especially late in the year. And I'm kind of bouncing all around because I'm worried I'm not going to cover anything. As the fishing goes on throughout the course of the winter here, the hardest time is usually in February. If we have ice in December, it's usually good first ice. Last ice is always good. Everybody knows that. But throughout the course of the year, after the fish get fished for for a while, there's been a lot of snow on the ice, and the winter is really dragging on in February, a lot of times the fish get real difficult to catch. And when you start mixing in these baits like this, that sink real fast, that do real different things, those can really, really be good. If you're ever fishing in clear water and you're having a hard time getting the fish to come into the hole to bite your bait, you need to try a Haley style Or a big spoon with some, you can do the same thing with a Swedish <coughs> pimple. You can put a chain drop around it like that. And that can be a phenomenal bait. Okay, so, so the jig and spoon style of baits can be really good. I've, I've experimented some too with more of a wobble kind of jig and spoon. Like this is basically a little steelhead spoon. This is like a little Cleo. Sometimes those flash real good and that can really get the fish going. Okay, so jig and style spoons, basically the way I work it is, I usually fish a hard bead. And that's when I spend most of my time fishing. When I can't seem to catch them, usually try a jigging style spoon before I give up. <coughs> Especially if I know there's fish there, whether they're on my screen or I can see them with my eyes. Because sometimes they'll come in and they'll bite that bait sitting still with that egg and they won't bite this. Okay? So before, so, before you use the spoon wrap? Um, yeah, that, it's kind of a feel style thing. Yeah, right. You know, but, but typically if I go, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but typically when I go out, I'm going to, let's say I can see and I'm going to sight fish. And I go to a place and I drill a hole and I put a hard bead down and I start jigging it. A couple pretty good fish come in or I'm seeing some keeper fish. I'm going to run through probably all four of these categories of baits before I move. And, and to, to kind of go into that further, the reason for that is if you go out and take that bait right there, any good beaded spoon, and you're fishing and keepers are coming in the hole and you start catching them, you run through for about 15 or 20 minutes and you've got some fish on the ice and they start to die, when you put any other bait down that hole, almost immediately those fish will come back in that hole. Look, it's just from seeing the hard thing. That'd be great if I caught one of those signs right now. They love it. So, so that's what I do. I, I run through all the categories, and usually it's just like this. I'll have one rod with a with a spoon, one rod with a wrap, one or two with a hard bead, and then some kinds of plastic. And you'll see, some days are just on some days better than others. Some days the way to catch more fish is to go through all your baits and catch a few more out of every hole. Some days the best way is simply to move. Even if you just move over 10 feet, then you'll catch one or two. In first ice periods, it's real common that when I go out or when my buddies that fish a lot and we do real well, typically let's say I catch, go out in the afternoon and we fish for three hours and I come home with 30 keepers. Those 30 keepers will probably come from 10 different holes. You know, if you catch four keepers out of one hole, it's like, man, that was a good hole. Usually it's one or two, one or two, one or two, and you come back and you can catch one or two, but, but that's what's going on is the fish get used to it. So you, you just keep giving them a different look. Or you drop another bait. Some days it's just more feasible to do. Like today, you know, it's so warm, I'm not changing baits anymore. But anyway, but in a shanty a lot of times I'll have a bunch of different baits. So, so a little bit about hard beads. You know, if, if, you, if you've heard a lot about these, which I'm sure you have, and you haven't had a chance really to use them, 
Um, it's, this is something that, that when I first moved here and I first started fishing with a lot of guys that fish here all the time, I was just immediately just just totally in love with the tactic, but just mystified by the way that some of these guys fish. Some of the best fishermen on this lake, guys that you see post all the pictures on the internet of all the big stringers of fish they catch and all the big buckets full, fish exclusively hard beats. I mean, they don't even carry anything else. That's a way that you can catch fish if you have a lot of places that you can go and you've got a lot of people you know that are fishing in different areas and you can always be by active fish, that's great. It doesn't work every day, but that is probably the category of bait uh, that, that I definitely rely on the most. Now, with these spoons, there's a bunch of different kinds and, and you almost have to get a feel for what you like the most yourself um, rather than what somebody tells you. But, but these big long ones, I know it's probably hard for some people to even imagine, you know, when you see these baits like this for sale, and you think, where in the world do they catch perch on something that's that big? When you're by active feeding perch, they're not necessarily worried about the size of the spoon. Because just like the rat, they're not eating the spoon. They're eating the beef. So all this is, is a way to attract them. And all that is, is a whole bunch of flash and a whole bunch of swimming motion like a school of shiners. And then as it settles down, for whatever reason, they key in on the bead and they eat it. Now my theory is, with just about all this stuff with artificial, is the reason they eat those beads or the egg or the thing on the back of the spoon is because they think it's something that is just settling in the water column after their buddies have mauled a bunch of shiners. Okay, I was on some boat docks off the Clinton River a couple years ago. The year we never got hardly any ice. You guys remember that? Okay, I fished, I remember I fished on the ice that year 18 days, and I never knew anybody that fished over about six. I mean, there was almost no ice, and that was just getting out a little piece here and there. We fished a lot out of my duck boat, which we knew every year, we don't have safe ice. And then we also fished off some docks. We're standing on these docks. And the night before it got cold and there was skim ice in the harbor. The river was open, the harbor had skim ice. Well, it was more than skim. It was maybe a half inch thick. A clear, solid, smooth ice. And the water was real clear. So we took spud bars and chopped holes right on the edge of the dock and we started fishing. And as I was fishing, I started seeing perch coming in. I lifted my bait up, it was only like two feet underneath the ice started catching perch. We were catching some big ones, and oh, there goes a big one. You could drop down, you could see them. And it was the only time I've ever seen this, because it was the only time I've ever been in that situation. You could see the waves underneath the ice of emerald shiners coming in that harbor. And you'd see the minnows swimming under the ice. I'm talking from here to the table away, I'd see the minnows. And behind it, all you saw were gold and orange flashes. And when they got up by my hole, you could see the shiners get pushed underneath the ice and the schools of perch would just roll on them right underneath the ice and just be mauling them and all the other perch would be underneath them eating all the pieces, parts and eating all the shiners coming down. And you'd watch that wave come and it'd start getting close to your hole and you'd be like, oh man, oh man, and they'd get by your hole and you'd go bam, 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 and then they'd swim away. And you'd watch them and you'd watch them and you'd walk off this dock and you'd go over to this dock and you'd go back up and you'd go bam, bam, it was awesome. But that really opened up my, my eyes as to why perch get so attracted to ice and come up under the ice and the way they feed. And I really feel that those bigger fish don't do a whole lot of chasing. They eat a lot of scraps. So, so what, you can, what you can imagine is that when these big beaded spoons are going down through the water, they're flashing like minnows. And then when they settle, that bead is just kind of rocking through the water and it stops, and they suck in that bead. Okay? Does bead color matter? Does bead color matter? Yes, it does, at times. Um, typically, you'll see most beads, you know, if you came here five, six years ago, almost everybody always used a red bead. Then people started using more glow and chartreuse style beads. One thing that you're hearing about now a lot, which I've got one actual fishing rods are purple beads. 
Um, I've seen days when bead color makes a big difference. And I know guys that really put a lot of emphasis on it. I typically stick by, you know, glow colors sometimes, red sometimes. I, I've caught a bunch of fish on purple. I can't tell you that for sure use this when this happens. But I know that if I'm not catching the fish and they're biting my spoon and I'm watching my line jump or I'm seeing them on a camera crashing at my bait and I'm not catching them, I'll a lot of times switch the color of my bait. Another thing that I do is I use a gold spoon a lot. And a lot of times people use strictly silver spoons and they work very well. But if you've ever seen a lot of the fish you catch in weedy areas, especially early in the year when you go to clean them, what's in their bellies? Gobies sometimes. Gills a lot of times too. And here also are little rock bass. Four or five years ago, the fishing was great on the spillway at first ice. A couple years in a row, of this, those fish were so full of little rock bass, it was unbelievable. And using a gold spoon for me a few days fishing out there was like flipping a switch. Now maybe it was the glow of the bait, maybe it was just a, maybe it was just me. But I use a lot of different color beads, like that's a black bead, and I use a lot of different color spoons. But but I don't have a I don't have a booklet for you that tells you for sure which one's best. That'd be up to you. The, the one thing I will tell you though is that when you use beaded spoons, you need to go out and get comfortable using a couple different styles because for instance, this spoon, okay, this is this is, you know, these are gaining in popularity quite a bit. This is a Guster style spoon. Um, this is a Ken, or this might be a slab grabber. But, but this spoon versus this spoon has tremendously different action. And some years, for whatever reason, you'll get a three or four week period where the best bait will be a long skinny bait swimming real far. This, this long skinny bait, when you snap it up and lift it up in the water a little bit and get it up above the bottom and snap it a couple times, when it swims back down, it swims to where you can't see it outside the hole. And if you guys have ever seen where you've got fish active and they're coming up around your bait and you're snapping a little bit and you can see them and they're going after it and they start to get kind of interested but they're not really biting it, they're around it, then you lift it up and you snap it where it swims, you'll see all those fish swim real fast to wherever that spoon's going. And a lot of times you'll see a real big fish swim out and over it. Frequently you'll catch smaller fish, take one off the hook and put a big long skinny spoon like that back in the water where it swims and you'll see a big fish go swimming out from under the hole. He's been sitting there where you can't see him. And he's been watching all those little fish chase what he thinks is a minnow. And now he thinks the pack of minnows is busted up and one of those shiners is swimming away from him and he's going to go get them. Same thing if you use minnows and you don't catch anything and then you, you get an active minnow that starts swimming your bait away, how those big fish love to chase that active minnow. And some days you got to have that super active minnow to even catch big fish. That's what's going on. Did you have a question real quick? Yeah, what about hammered versus smooth? Hammered versus smooth. I've, I've got hammered hard beads, and I can't tell you that I've ever seen that make a huge difference. Um, it may. You know, a ham, the, the theory is with a hammered blade or a hammered spoon or whatever you're using in fishing, that reflects light from a lot of different angles. So I'm sure that at times that could make a big difference, but I've never seen where it does. So, so a teardrop with a wax worm is more for a smaller fish? You can catch a 15-inch perch on a teardrop with a wax worm. But is it is it not as productive? It's the, the, the way we're talking about now is we're moving around to find active fish that are chasing and actively eating. Okay. You know, if it's to the point where I've got to do something like that, chances are I'm moving and looking for active fish. Okay. And, and Typically, you know, it's it's not uncommon for me to fish one part of the lake and not do well and load up and go to a completely different part of the lake. You know, because that's just the style that I like. So this kind of stuff is more like that. I mean, you know, it, it's like if it ain't broke, don't fix it type of thing. I'm I'm well aware of, of you know, there's times when I cannot catch them, and I see guys that just sit in one spot all day and soak minnows and they catch them. That ain't for me. You know, so so. You know, there, this none of this is, this is all theory. This is nothing in stone. Oh, I know, but it, it, you bring up some great points. Uh, you know, I, I was just wondering about, 
the old time shit. You know, yeah, like, you know. and it still works. Yeah. You know, but this is these, these are just methods to to try and kind of up the odds and make it a little more fun or to, okay. just to, just to kind of fall into that different mold. You know? So um, the other thing too is is with with other other spoons, if you guys are going to start trying hard beads. You know, this style spoon, this is what I refer to as a squared front spoon. Okay, years ago, when when guys first started manufacturing, making hard bead spoons and using them, a lot of them were squared off front spoons. Now, that's not a very common bait anymore. You hardly even see them in a lot of places around here. Um, but they swim out of the hole totally different than, than a rounded nose. And they also, when they settle, when you snap them, They'll just flip over one time and settle back down. They won't flip over and go like this. They just go flip. And some days, I have seen that make a huge difference. As a matter of fact, one of the ones I use is this one. This is one some guys call like a water pipe style spoon. It's, a, it's that that feel. It just, but it's it's not the spoon I start with. You know what I mean? There's just It's just like if you guys have ever walleye, jig for walleyes, and you've got a handful of baits you use, hand liner, all the types of fishing we do. There's always something that, man, that one time it worked, it was really great. And every now and then, you'll fall back into that spot again, in that hole, and it'll work really great again. But, but typically, you know, these, these more conservative, rounder styles. Another one, I talked about this before, um, this is a diamond willow spoon. That guy makes a great spoon overall. It's, it's, it's less aggressive than the gusters and the slab grabbers and some of the fancier ones you're seeing now. It wobbles a little slower, but day in and day out, it's a really good spoon. I like the ones that are pretty heavy and fall pretty fast because I want to get it on and get it going. And when that's not working, I want to move and do it again. And like today, the wind's blowing stuff. I don't want to play around with my line and I want it down there and snap it and snap it and move. I noticed it's always I, I, I do use some colors. Um, you know, this is here's a white one. I've seen white work very, very well. I've done decent at times on real crazy color painted chartreuses and things, but for the most part, I almost always use gold or silver and sometimes I still in the white. Crazy color like that. A couple years back <laughs> I, I can totally agree with you because I've got spoons in here. He mentioned he had a, a phenomenal day with something like that, and he's never done it again. I've got a bait somewhere that I could show you that I swear to you I wouldn't have sold you for a hundred dollars that day. That was so good for like a week, and I've never caught him on that spoon again. And then I've got, you know, that's the other thing too is that there's a million manufacturers of these baits now, and there's always in places like this or tackle stores, there's always some up at the counter that are just kind of local made or whatever it is, and sometimes you'll fall into one. It's got a little more weight on it, whether it's solder or whatever it is, it's got a little different action. I've had at least 10 baits that I would pay big money to have them back, that I've lost them to fish or dropped them down the hole or whatever it is. To the point where now I carry, when I fish out of the shanty, I carry a magnet in my in my shanty with a rope on it because if I drop a couple of these down, I'm getting them. Somehow I'm getting them. Because some of them just work different. You know, my buddy had one that worked so good he broke the hook off of it and he had the hook replaced. So, so you can, you can imagine. So, so if you're gonna try beaded spoons, um, I want you to know that that you need to have a bunch of different styles, a bunch of different sizes and things, and try them. And and, and there's not one particular one that's better than the rest. But, but you need to, you need to just realize that that's all it really takes to catch fish on this lake because we have so many fish, and because we fish shallow, aggressive fish more more often than not. You know, you drop them down, you jig them. There's a bunch of different jigging strokes and methods you could use. Some of the best fishermen I know with beaded spoons, drop them down the hole, get them to the bottom, lift them just a little bit off the bottom, just snap them a couple times, and hold them. Snap them, and hold them. When the fish are aggressive, I like to fish them where I snap them real high up in the water column to get them swimming, get them swimming. And I've got one buddy in particular that's the best beaded spoon fisherman I know. When the fish are aggressive, I always catch them over him. But as soon as it gets tough, he cleans my clock. Because I can't get myself to do that. I mean, I can, but it's just like, and sometimes I actually just leave him sit there. 
and then just shake the rod a little bit. Because that bait's wobbling. Okay, and the water and the current is moving that bait around a little bit, and it's reflecting light a little bit. You know, you don't necessarily have to always swim it, but as soon as things get tough, whenever you're using any of these baits, get it up in the water column and really get it dancing. How do you tie the beaded spoon on? I use the same little snap. Yes, how to tie it. I use the same little snap for everything. Okay. The only thing I don't use a snap for is, is uh, plastic. The one thing, though, guys, if you get these little snaps or, or whatever you use, you know, just, just be aware that when you're doing that and you're snapping your bait a lot, I'm using three-pound line, okay, and I'm snapping my bait a lot, I'm snapping my bait, and it's constantly getting on the edge of the ice going in and out of the hole, and you catch 25 dinks in a row, and, you know, stuff's flying everywhere. You're really fatiguing that line, and you're fatiguing that little snap. You know, pretty much almost every day I go fishing, I peel some line off and retie. And these little snaps, eventually the little ears break out. So you got to check all that stuff, otherwise you'll lose your favorite spoon. Okay? Um, the other thing, too, when you're using beaded spoons, or any of these baits, but it really comes into play with these, is I carry this in my pocket. Okay, I carry these to cut my line, because no matter what line it is, I always use these. Who uses their teeth to bite fishing line? Got a nice groove for wow, yeah. you. Do you use white fishing line with your teeth? Why not? Because it'll break the teeth, right? I was, you know, 20 some years old and was eating something that spit a tooth out one day that it broke from shattering, from being shattered on fishing line. Had my teeth capped a bunch of times, continuously broke teeth biting fishing line. It will break your teeth. If you bite fishing line, I want you to think right now, you always use the same tooth. Go tonight and look as close as you can get to the mirror in your bathroom and go like this and you'll see little shatters in that tooth. That tooth will break something. Okay, so I carry these to cut my line. But what I was really getting at is this is a little diamond hook stone for sharpening your hooks. Sharp hooks make such a difference in any kind of fishing. It's amazing. So I frequently will, you know, if I have one that gets dulled, you know, you got to imagine sometimes you catch hundreds and hundreds of fish, and all it takes is just a couple little strokes on a diamond stone, and you can really get it sharp when it digs into your thumbnail like that. That's what you want, okay? Because when they suck that little bead in, everybody here can think back to the last time you went ice fishing, and you felt the bite, and you lift it up, and it was like, oh, oh, and you felt your rod go, whoa, and you're like, that was a big one. That was long. Okay, because that's a little bitty hook point. Where do you get a good one like that? Uh, this one I got from the North American Fishing Club when I renewed my membership. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I don't know. Yeah, you gotta look around. No, I'm little stone. I'm the pins that are the the spoons with the hard beads. Now that hard beat, so you're not burying that hook in that fish's mouth. Well, here's, here's the other thing, since we're kind of getting intricate here. If you look at all my spoons, the ones I fish with every single day, none of them have any barbs. Okay, and the reason for that is when you're fishing here and you're going through tons and tons of fish and you're catching fish after fish, and a lot of times you have to catch dinks to catch big ones, you want to be able to lift them out of the hole, set them on the ice, and have them come off. Okay, and guys, if you leave your fish on the ice and it's 11 degrees and windy, you're <laughs> killing those fish, whether you want to admit it or not. If you kick them back in the hole and they lay there for a while and they're froze and then they slowly swim away, they're dead. So don't leave them lay on the ice. Get yourself a little bucket with some water. If you don't want to put your little dinks back in the hole, that's a debatable thing. I, a lot of times, don't like to do that. I will tell you this, though, from watching it a million times on a camera, we're going to talk about that in a minute. If you let those fish lay on the ice for a little while and they're not dead, and you put them back in the hole, and you've got fish in that hole, those fish will leave. When those fish that you release that are half dead get in the hole, they go down to the bottom and they sit on the bottom. And those active fish will leave. It will absolutely kill your bite. So you either need to get the fish up, the little ones, as soon as you drop them off, kick them right back in the hole, because that doesn't screw anything up. They don't know that anything's happened there. They think, oh, my little buddy's chasing something. Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. They don't know that something's bad. Or you need to bring him out of the hole, put him in a bucket with some water, or if it's a pretty nice day out, what a lot of times 
I do and my buddies do is we drill a hole and then we drill a hole next to it that's not all the way down to the bottom through the ice. Eight inches of ice, drill six inches down and fill down the water. And then put ten dinks in that and then scoop them right back in the hole. You can do that or you can have a little slush bucket. If it's 30 degrees out, you know, those fish will lay and flop around on that ice and be totally fine for the five minutes that you're working the hole and then you can kick them all back in. But when it's like today, they die. When they freeze, they die. So, so you don't want to necessarily put wounded fish back in your hole. But, but that's the whole deal. With the barb down, what you can usually do is probably three quarters of the little ones, when you get them up to the hole, you can drop your tip and they'll roll over and you can kind of go like this and they'll come off and lay right on top of your hole for a minute, then they'll turn around and swim away. So you can almost be calling through them without even taking them out of them. But I do, I put, I put all the, I mash all the barbs down. Sometimes the bead will cover the barb with a hook, but like this is a perfect example. You can see that bead has now slid all the way up there because that spoon has been used so many times the hole has gotten kind of hogged mm -hmm. out. And that's another thing too, guys, is that has a different action than that. These are all little things that you've got to spend some time on the ice and look at. And you'll see that when the bead is like, this is a soft bead on this one, this is just an egg. But when it's like that, that spoon swims way better than if it's like that. If you break the bead off, you put a soft bead on. If I have a spoon I really like, I'll, yeah. put, a soft bead. I'll put a soft egg on it if you break the bead off. Some of these baits, like this bait, came with a bead that didn't work good. So you had to break the beads off to get more. This is a real weird bait. But most of the stuff, that's the other thing too, is that over the last four, five, six, eight years, there's been more and more guys, more and more manufacturers of good beaded spoons. You know, six or eight years ago, there was a lot around, but in everyday places around here, we didn't have as many, you know, that, that I think are on the counter that you could, that you could count on. Whereas here now, I mean, like this shop's a perfect example. They've got everything you need as far as being spoons are all the best ones. So whether, you know, again, you'll have to, you'll have to experiment to see which ones you want. Let's, let's just hit real quick. Go ahead, sir. Is the scent a big factor? I think it is a certain styles of fishing. Um, you know, I, I can go into that at length on a lot of things, but I've never seen on the ice that it is. You know, you're talking about using a soft bead that smells like something versus a hard bead. What we're talking about here, you know, fishing fairly quick and fishing with all our officials, the fish in those situations are coming in and biting. They're not really sniffing. Um, but I know that those beads that you take, or the, the, when I put a, an egg on a rapala, and it's those eggs that have that real good ant smell, I like those. So, maybe. Um, the last thing we should probably touch on is plastics. And, and I normally wouldn't even really talk too much about it, but, but the last few years I've gotten more into fishing plastics, and, and a lot of people have because there's better plastics now than there ever was. And they are a phenomenal deadly method of catching fish. Now I've always used plastics for fishing for bluegills and pumpkin seeds and crappies because they're just awesome. But, but for perch, you know, there's a lot of plastics on the market now that when things are tough, they catch a lot of fish. And for me, like this bait right here, this is called a nuggy. Okay, I'm assuming you have nuggies. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, and, and any kind of plastic, th this one you know, I, I don't really know the history of uh, how it was actually invented, but uh, yeah, I'm sure they, these guys either invented it or know how it was. Um, but it's just got an action to it that's unlike any other plastic. There's a lot of good plastics now, uh, but but day in and day out, that little nuggy, that little round body nuggy, has a really good action. And that tail quivers and and moves in the water. Even you cannot hold it still. If you hold your rod like this with both hands and hold that thing perfectly still in the water, it still is quick. And you can tell because you can hold it still and you'll see the perch come up to it. They get closer to it and closer to it and then they just bite. There's other baits when you hold them still, they get closer and closer and then they back off. Uh, Bison, do you have any like style body or tail that you prefer over another one? Yeah, me, me personally, as far as style bodies or tails, I've, I've started using a lot more of the, of the little plastics that Northland has out now, too, these little 
um, you know, mayfly style baits and things that are like this, and, and they're very good, and there's, there's a bunch of different plastics. But if you gave me one to perch fish on this lake, I'd use another. And I'd use that size nugget right there. They come in several sizes. Okay, but the thing is about any kind of plastic is that this isn't something where I'm, we're going to go fishing and we're going to use beaded spoons, jigging wraps, and jigging spoons and catch none, and then we're going to catch them on this. That can happen. But the way that I use it is I fish a hole, and when I stop catching them, I always drop this down the hole. And I can't tell you how many times I catch one or two more big fish by dropping the plastic. I drop it all the way to the bottom, I lift it up, and then I just shake it. And usually what happens is the fish come in almost immediately, and you just slowly lift it and lift it and lift it and lift it, and then they just eat it. That is a great way to catch one or two more big fish. I almost always drop this, and I almost always drop a jigging wrap. And that's on a little teardrop? Is that this, no, this is on a little, um, what is the head on this? What is that uh, wedge-shaped diamond, diamond yeah. jig? Is it I don't know if that was even. Yeah, but but just any kind of little short squat sure. jig head. This one I like because it's unlike a lot of little ones. This one has a very big hook for its size, and, and the little bitty hooks I don't like for a big big fish. But there's so many really good tungsten heads and things. But just be careful because when a lot of times when you get to those super small tungsten jigs, they do have real good weight. They drop real fast. They show up great on electronics, but some of them have super tiny hooks. And that'll pin and hold a, a, a gill on a crappie real good, but at least for me and the way that I fish, I don't like them for perch as much. I like a little bit more meat in the gap. Uh, so, so that's a little bit. Now, you know, all of this probably we should touch on. i got to kind of wrap it up here. We should touch on a couple of things when it comes to equipment, too. Um, I mentioned to you that, that I'm using three pound line and that's what this is. This is three pound suffix ice magic. Okay, and this is a, uh, not a bright fluorescent line, but this is a line that, that uh, isn't clear. Okay, I use clear line for certain things, but this has a little bit of uh, the ability to see it against the background of the water. Okay, this is like a tangerine color and I really like it. Some guys use real gold line and things. I don't think that really makes a, a difference. I think you can get away with it. Um, but, but I like that. But, but rods, you know, that's another thing to consider too, is that in today's day and age, we're seeing so many, so much better equipment for ice fishing. You know, ice fishing is really, in our part of the world, it's really coming out now, uh, moving into the 21st century, beyond just the, the little stick rods with the little windy thing. You know, all this stuff, you know, is, is very technical. And, and, Part of the reason that you you can be so successful is because all this stuff is balanced a certain way. It, you know, it all sits nice in your hand. You can palm the reels. I really like these, these you know, level Y style, Y style reels because they're so super low uh, maintenance and easy to use. They don't twist your line. You see how straight my line is. So even with little bitty baits, that's just just totally the way to go. But but your rods are really important too. You don't want a rod that has no flex. But you also don't want the old school super spongy ultralight rods when you're trying to catch 10 and 12 inch perch. Okay, your rod's got to have enough give in it so when a fish eats your bait or sucks the bead in on your spoon, it's got to have a little flex. But it's got to have enough meat to move a fairly big fish. Okay, th this this is a, a, a fray bill rod. And all the rods I use are these what they call quick tips. And, and those have that balance of flex in the top, you know, and, and a good taper along the buck. But, but I use a couple different ones, and I want to show you, regardless of the kind of rod or the, or the, or the manufacturer, you know, what we're seeing now more of is, is rods like this. This is a 36-inch rod, okay? And typically when I fish, I don't sit down. Occasionally I do. But if I'm jumping around from hole to hole, I want a rod that when I'm fishing it, my rod tip is almost in the water. Because when I'm standing there and I'm comfortable and my rod tip is laying almost in the water, I've got no wind blowing my line, I've got a lot less line to freeze, 
and I could stand there and I could see that little tip, and if it jumps or whatever it is that might signal a bite, I'm looking right at it against the dark background of the hole, and I'm super comfortable. I mean, I'm just standing like this, right? And you can see with my height and, and the way I am, that is like a perfect height for me. When I jump from hole to hole to hole, all I got to do is lift my rod up, drop my line back down. Okay? You want to be fishing near the bottom and get your bottom set, whatever it is, you're right there, you're fishing good, you lift it up, it's the same thing. And when I'm working something real fast and real aggressive and I'm moving it, I'm moving a lot of lines so I can really get my bait working. Okay, so, so regardless of the type of rod you buy or what you're using, you need to look into some of these longer ones, especially if you're somebody that likes to just go out on a bucket and hop around. Now, I would never use that in a shanty. I would if it was a big shanty, like a big beer drinking shanty, where you go out there and, you know, there's like a hole there and a hole there and a hole there and a hole there, and there's like four people on the TV and you got the cooler and the other cooler. And, and, and you're eating soup and all that, that's one thing. But like in a little one-man flip-over style, you can never comfortably sight fish looking down the hole like this. So for that, I use a real little rod. But again, this is only a 22-incher, but you can see, you know, it's got still a pretty soft tip section, and it's got a little bit more meat here in the butt. And I could sit there and I could just fish a hard bead right underneath me like that and catch them that way, okay? So, so look into that. Now the other thing that you might have seen that's becoming very popular is this rod here. This is called a jiggler. And what this is, is the line goes through the blank of this rod. Okay, now the, the reel is, is all one piece. Okay, so it's real easy, real low maintenance. Um, but this rod is intended and was designed to fish for panfish in shallow water like bluegills and crappies where you can just catch one, and then if you don't catch one, you can just lift your line up and go to the next hole and put it back down. See, with a, this rod's 48 inches long, whereas if I had to lift, if I was an eight foot of water, and I had to lift the fish out of the hole, I could never really do it with this. With this, <coughs> I could lift the fish out of the hole in 12 foot of water, probably. It's like fishing with a cane pole. The reason that when you go to Florida or you go to places in the south and you see the people on the banks with those big, long, 16-foot poles and you think, man, it's modern times here, folks. Buy a reel, right? The reason they still use those is because it's incredibly efficient. Drop it in, catch your crappie, lift them out. Take them off, drop it in. You don't need a reel. It's better to not have them. Okay, so what this is is that's the same thing. Now, this comes with a little spring bobber on it. I, you know, that doesn't make a whole lot of difference to me, but it's really super light, you know, and it's, it's, it's really super sensitive because the line is not blowing against the blank, the line's all the inside, so it's really, really sensitive. But I started using this rod two or three years ago for fishing here with artificials for perch, specifically with hard beads. And the more I'm using rods like this, the more I'm starting to think that that might be the way to go, especially real late in the year. Real late in the year when the fish get real shallow, it makes a noticeable difference. It's hard to believe if you stand over the hole versus if you stand away. Now, I wish I had something, and I'm going to drop something off here at one time, but I'm starting to put more and more AquaView footage on one of my Facebook sites. My name is Joe Baylog. I've got a couple different sites, but one's called Joe Baylog's Millennium Promotions. Now, I know that's probably hard to remember. But if you go on and you find, we have a Gobi replica with a bunch of sites, but Joe Baylog's Millennium Promotions, you'll start to see more and more AquaView footage. <laughs> One thing I filmed last year, there was two things. One was what it looks like to the fish under the water when you're sitting on clear ice with no snow. It is like a giant block. I mean, you see this giant sun block where it's this noticeable big shanty sitting on the ice where you think, man, why would a fish even swim under? And then you move away from it and stand with a jiggler and you can't see anything. And the other thing you'll see on there is we shot a video last year here of what happens when people walk around on the ice. Did anybody see that? It was on Aquaview's page last year. Did you see it? They had, I was fishing and I, was, I had a big, huge school of perch in the hole. And a guy walked up to me and you could hear him walking, not dragging us like just walking. And all the fish immediately swam out of the hole. 
So that's always stuff. So you see, you see some really cool stuff when you're looking with a camera. So I'll, I'll put more of those on that Facebook. Do you have a question? Do I fish with a spring bobber or what? I'm a jiggler. Do you usually take it off? No, I leave it on because I don't find that it makes any real big difference in the way my bait works or anything. And occasionally I watch it to see if it jumps. But most of the fishing I do, I'm not looking at a spring bobber. But this one's kind of cool because after it starts getting weighted one direction from being hung up, you can just turn it, you can fish like that, and then it sticks up. So it's kind of neat. But for gills and stuff, for sure. You can't, you can't drop it. All right, last couple questions, guys. you have anything? We covered a lot of stuff. When you use them tungsten style jigs, when you tie them on tighter, you still use the snap. Um, when I fish with plastics, I tie directly to the plastic. Now, I know some guys that are really, really good at fishing with plastics. And they tie with a loop knot to make sure their bait falls perfectly horizontal. The one thing I will tell you is that if you use these nuggies, if your bait goes like this, the fish will not hit it like they will if it's tucked up against the bait. I don't know what it is, but I can't tell you how many times that if it pulls down on the hook, like you lift the little one out and take them off, and there's a big one in your hole, and you drop it back down there, and it's like that, they, they just almost never, for me, will hit that bait. If I'll push it back up to where it's seated, and it should be coming out, you know, it should come through the water pretty much horizontally, they will hit the bait a lot more. I'm by no means an expert with these things. I can tell you that I've caught a lot of fish on them. They kind of stick to the same colors. I drop them down the hole for one or two more. They're just a phenomenal bait at times. The other plastic that I've used a lot that you guys probably should try sometime because it'll blow you away sometimes is just a standard tube like you'd use for crappies. This one's kind of a modified deal. But if you use a little like one and a half or two inch tube and you put like a sixteenth ounce head in it so it falls pretty quick, there's times that they just railroad that thing. When you snap it, it swings around like a jigging rack. But the fish are really hard to hook on it sometimes. I'm still playing with that. You get a lot of big ones that'll hit it and you'll pull on them and they'll come off. I've actually got this one rigged with a treble hook with a stinger where I actually went in, cut the hook, rolled it over, put a treble, and it works great, except for every single fish that bites it, you have to now tape off the hook. See? They like the tube, too. So, so, I mean, you know, this is all a work in progress. Like I said, I by no means know everything. All I know is I've got a lot of different baits that I rely on that I like. Um, here's another thing, too, if you fish plastics with some of these tungsten baits that's really kind of crazy weird, especially with gills and crappies. Some of these ones that just have a straight tail, like that's a tungsten jig with a straight little, this is an ISG tail, but there's a lot of plastics manufacturers that make just a straight little, straight little tail. If you rig that like that, where it's actually got a kink, it seems to work way better than if you rig it perfectly straight. Either it twists on the fall a little bit a certain way, for whatever reason, those with a little kink is the way I rig it, and I've had way better success with that. But that's a pumpkin seed destroyer right there, right out here. I mean, that's, I would never take live bait to catch the gills and stuff out here, because they love stuff like that. You get a lot more bang for your buck. This is a rat so jig. That's another really, really good one. I have kind of feed up, but that could be really good. Uh, but, but try all that stuff, guys. If you want to look at some of this stuff, this deal, point is you're in the front row. That is a sweet jig and wrap combo right there. And it's also a really good rod for, for walleye fishing, for Saginaw River, smaller, medium sized walleyes. You'll like that. It's a nice big long combo. You like it. Because you were here earlier. Yep. All those times in class you haven't sat in the front row, you finally did look up. <laughs> <laughs> They're always fishing different heights in the column of water, but the bottom being the best. Start that way. Uh, yes? Yeah, but I bring my bait up high real okay, fast. Right. It's not right. working. That's where you're starting. And I, yeah. I will tell you that if you guys fish anywhere around here in the next week, <coughs> a lot of the fish have come up real high. 
Oh. And and that usually happens, like I said, it usually happens late in the ice season, where we'll start to see a lot more success fishing up high. The, the way that you know that you need to do that is if you're fishing near the bottom and you can see, whether it's with your eyes or with the camera, or if you're prone to using electronics, you can see, and you're catching some and you're seeing some fish, and you bring your bait up from this far under the ice to, you know, halfway up in six foot of water or more. I mean, where your bait's right there, and you see fish come in, and they appear to come in horizontally, instead of where you see the lips coming up from the bottom to see what's going on up there. You know how you see the little perch that come up and you see their little mouths coming up? If you start doing that and you see fish go like this, and they're swimming horizontally, those fish were high to begin with. And you're, you're fishing under them. I mean, that's a lot of times we catch a lot of big fish doing that when other people are struggling to catch fish. But definitely, if you work a hole and you're catching them and then you're not catching them, you need to bring your bait up. You'll catch one or two more big ones that way. And then you drop a Haley down, you'll catch a big one. And then you'll get the fish going for a minute and then they'll die off again and you reach down real quick and you grab a plastic and you drop it down. And boom, a great big one comes in the hole and he doesn't bite. You reel it up real fast and grab a jigger and put it back down and snap it. That's how you do it. That's, it's fun, man. It is fun to do it that way. But you got to have all these rods and all this stuff, and you get all tangled up, and it's big. But when it's working, it's, it's total fun when it's working. And it's, you know, especially if you're bucket hopping and it's 30 degrees out and you can move around, that's a great way to fish and a good way to catch a couple big ones in each hole. But when it's blowing and it's 15 degrees and you're in the shanty, drop a bunch of stuff down first and let's see. You'll get the fish at you. Thanks for sticking around for my jump around seminar. I really appreciate it. Make sure you check out that Facebook.